This year we've uh, approached things a little bit differently in that we are preaching, covering a book of the Bible each Sunday and at least addressing one of the major themes, certainly not all of them, but one of the major themes that are found in each of the books. And today we're in the book of Joshua chapter 14 and the title of the message is Victory Leads to Rest. Victory leads to rest. Now, by its own definition here, if victory leads to rest, before you have victory, you first have to have a conflict, right? Or a problem or a struggle. And when you go through that and you come out the other side, that's when you can take a deep breath and a sigh of relief and experience some rest as a result of that. We use the term rest in a lot of things, one of the more common ones is restrooms. I've never gone in a restroom just to rest. <laughs> to take a nap. No. <laughs> you go in there because you have a conflict. And then you can experience rest. Think about that next time you go to a restroom. <laughs> I dare you. I challenge you. I dare you to go somewhere next time. A public restroom. You walk in. Somebody's coming out. And they're coming in as you're coming out. Say, hey, my preacher just preached on this the other day. <laughs> They'll be like, so what kind of church you go to? There are rest areas. Now, they are legitimately set aside so you can pull in there and get out of the traffic you know, you can unwind a little bit. You can take a nap. You can get a snack. You, you can do those types of things. There's a legal term called rest my case or I rest my case. I've presented all the evidence, and now I'm just going to step back and, and let it speak for itself. There's another term we may be familiar with. We like to give this term and use it with other people. We don't like people to give it to us. When people say, give it a rest. See, we like to say it to people because we think they need it. We don't necessarily want them to say it to us. Give it a rest. I, I made some notes here. There's a lot of areas, particularly around relationships and particularly around the marriage relationship, and i got to be really careful here. <laughs> Although we do have a conference coming up next weekend, so I can make up some ground. <laughs> but, but I wrote this note when I was thinking about it, particularly as it relates to marriages, but it can apply to any relationship. It is, you can be right, or you can have rest. If an issue in a relationship costs you your rest or your peace, then it's too expensive. Rest is a precious commodity. I'm talking about rest that brings on peace and just relaxation where you can just breathe in the air and you can admire the beauty of God's creation, and you can enjoy the moment and, and be grateful for what you currently have. Last night, um, we went to both of our grandsons playing church basketball at, at their respective ages, and after the game, KK and Kyle play on that same team with my youngest grandson, and after the game, KK made her way over in the stands where we were, and I was congratulating her because she had made a basket, and she went up to, to my wife, and she said, You owe me $5. <laughs> and I looked at KK, and I looked at my wife, and I'm like, What's this about? And my wife said, Well, she was so timid that I told her to get more aggressive and get the rebounds and put the ball back, and if she made a basket, I would give her $5. And I looked at, and she made it, and, and I looked at KK, and I said, do you realize that's my $5? <laughs> and 
And this is what she said to me. She said, you owe me $5 too. <laughs> Amen. I said, how did that come about? She said, you promised me. I said, I've been gone on vacation for a week and a half. She said, you did it before you left. <laughs> but listen, they experienced victory. They won the game. You with me? They had victory and then... She was at a place where she could be restful and peaceful, particularly toting off my $10. Which, by the way, I have, KK. Make sure you see me before the service is over. Think about when a big storm comes through, and, and maybe a hurricane. We've lived through several of those here in this region. And after that, it has passed. The storm is gone. It is peaceful and tranquil. And the birds are singing. If you go out at night, the skies are crystal clear. And, and there's just this period of rest. But it's only after you've experienced victory coming through the storm. Today's message is all about victory leads to rest. We're going to look at part of the life of Caleb and what he went through, and ultimately he found rest, and the nation of Israel experienced rest largely in part because of his actions and his choices, decisions. And as we work our way through this message today, I want you to leave here today saying, there are one or two or three things that I can do in my life that will help me to experience rest. It's going to be very practical for you to be able to put that in to action. Joshua chapter 14, beginning at verse 6. It says, A delegation or representatives from the tribe of Judah. Now, the nation of Israel was divided or identified by 12 different groups. They were all the same nation, the same people, but they were in 12 different groups with tribal leaders. One of the tribes is Judah. And here it says, A delegation from the tribe of Judah led by Caleb, because he was their tribal leader at this point, and he gives us some history about who he belonged to, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Now, why is this important? It's very important for this reason. The nation of Israel, once they got led out of Egypt's bondage, they wandered 40 years in the wilderness. They have finally, under Joshua's leadership, because Moses has died, he didn't get in the promised land, by the way, nor did Aaron, and we'll talk about that briefly in just a moment. They have crossed the Jordan River. So you've got the, the wilderness over here. You've got the Jordan River that divided the promised land. They've just crossed over. And when they get there, they set up these 12 memorial stones about the victory that God has brought to them. That took place at Gilgal. That's where they observed their first Passover. It is where they had a central place of worship set up. It is later where Saul was crowned king, and it was their staging area before they left Gilgal to go over to Jericho when they did the march around and the walls came tumbling down. You remember that part of the story. So Gilgal is a significant place, and they are still located at Gilgal. Not long after they've crossed over Jordan, they've experienced that victory. They're getting ready to go over to Jericho and have another victory. But it's during this time that Caleb approaches Joshua, and this is what he says. Caleb said to Joshua, Remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me, when we were at Kadesh Barnea. There's several things right here in that one, one part of that verse. One is, he reminds Joshua what has been said. He says, to remember and think back what Moses, he establishes the authority. He says, Moses, the man of God, spoke to us a word all the way back to Kadesh Barnea. Now, this is interesting fact. What he is referencing to took place 45 years earlier. There is a promise from God given to Caleb 45 years earlier that has not yet come to pass. He hasn't forgot it and he's still holding on to the promise. Sometimes our greatest victories come what we think is a delay. It may be days, weeks, months, or even years, but here's the good news. If God has spoken a promise from His Word to you, rest assured you will see it come to pass in His perfect timing. 
And so 45 years, and he's reminding him there's a lot of history that has transpired and taken place. Joshua's the new leader. They've just crossed over. They're getting ready to go over the Jericho, and there's a lot of movement and things that are going on. But he says, listen, I want to remind you of what God spoke to Moses. Notice about you and me at Kadesh Barnea. Now let me remind you of some of the history of Kadesh Barnea. Unlike Gilgal... Kadesh was a place where Abraham originally, hundreds of years prior to this event, fought the Amalekites. It is where Moses sent out the 12 spies to go out and scope out the land so they could come up with a plan how to go into the promised land. Ten of them brought back a very negative report. You remember that? They all said, we saw this, 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 and this. Ten said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. We think that. They think that. They'll destroy us and kill us. We can't go over there and have what God said belongs to us already. And only Joshua and Caleb were the only two that said, what are y'all talking about? We need to go right now and take what God said belongs to us. It is also the place at Kadesh where Miriam... Moses and Aaron's sister died and was buried. It is also the location that later on where they were experiencing a water shortage. God spoke to Moses. He said, speak to the rock. Let the water come out and I'm going to demonstrate my glory and my power. Aaron went along with it. Moses got a little bit upset at the people and he struck the rock twice. And listen, that was an expensive strike because he said to Aaron and to Moses, he said, because y'all have disobeyed me, he said, you neither one of you are going to get to the promised land. So Kadesh Barnea literally reminds us it's a place of pain and failure of the past. I'm going to give you a chance to jump right on in the message right here and participate. I'm going to go ahead and put up both of my hands. Have you ever experienced a place of pain or loss or suffering, bad choices, decisions, from the past that you wish you could go back and change, raise your hand. I've got both of mine up. I'm going to see if we've got any untruthful people. I say, oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. We can all identify that. But that is what Kadesh Barnea reminds us of. But he said, even in the place where it was painful, even in the place where it was a great deal of loss and suffering to us, He said, I want you to remember the promises that God made to us in that painful place. I can tell you from personal experiences, I have heard from God more clearly, more directly, through His Word and by His Holy Spirit in my places of pain and suffering and loss and got more promises to me through His Word in those places than I ever have when I was walking in what seemed to be total victory. You and I need to remember the promises of God that He made to us in our Kadesh Barnea season. What God spoke to your heart, to your mind, to your emotions, and to your spirit. And He's saying, you remember that occasion 45 years ago. I would have had a trouble probably remembering, but probably not because of the promise and magnitude because I was just thinking, I can't even remember what I did yesterday. And so he brings it to his recollection about this conversation they had with Moses 45 years earlier. Look at verse 7. He said, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. I returned and gave an honest report. And the word honest there literally means from the heart. He was passionate about it. Listen, he reported, he and Joshua both reported the facts as they were, but they did it with a right heart knowing that God was able to give them what he had promised to them. The interesting thing about that story that I find is all 12 of them, including the ones who said we, we're not able to do it, they're bigger than us, they're giants, they got big cities with big walls, there's no way we can go in there. They all saw and reported the same facts. The difference was their heart and their trust in God. He said, and I gave an honest report. Look at verse 8. But my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. My brothers, those who went with me, the other ten, the the total of twelve. And I wrote here, just because someone is with you, starts out with you, doesn't mean they are for you or going with you all the way to your promised land. I'm going to say that again because it's very important. 
Not everybody in your circle of friends or even all of your family who started on this journey with you are going to your promised land with you. Some of them are going to drop out along the way. Some of them are going to look at the circumstances and say the cost is too great, it is too risky, I'm not going there. Whether or not you get there depends on your commitment to God and believing His promise to you. Can I tell you there are some folks that are no longer a part of this local church and fellowship because in its early days it was difficult and it was a struggle and there were just a few people and they said, "Mm, the price is too great, I don't know when and if this will ever change. You can't offer me what I want and what I think I need, therefore I'm going to go by the way. But I'm glad. There was a group of people who said, we're going to keep plugging away until God gets us where He wants us to be. Till we see the promised land as He has destined it for us. He says, They frightened the people from entering the promised land. Who or what has frightened you from claiming your promise that God has already given to you? The fact that He established early on that God spoke to Moses, the man of God, and spoke until to their life, reminds us of the importance is be careful who you listen to. There are some of us who have never reached the spiritual level or the calling God designed for our life Because we listen to the negative report of somebody around us. There are some of you who never started the business that God placed in your heart because you listened to the people who said you can't do that. Oh, and the list could go on and on and on. And I don't I don't want to get sidetracked right here, but I feel that so strongly this morning. Be careful. Who is speaking into your life because their report will either cause you to be victorious and pursue the things of God or it will cause you to be defeated in your life. But notice, and I want you to pay close attention to this next line. He said, but for my part, with all of that history, with all that was going on at Kadesh Barnea, with all the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and finally getting into the promised land, he said, for my part, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. It's probably the most important part of this message, in my opinion, and that's the first of three times you're going to see this statement used in the next few verses. Is And this is, this is how I see it. Caleb made a choice and decision, listen, when he was still a slave in Egypt, that he was going to serve God. When there was an entire nation and people group that didn't like him, that was forcing him and his people into hard labor... In mistreating them, Caleb's objective and priority was, I'm going to serve God with all of my heart. I've got to be careful here. We have a difficult time and challenge oftentimes. If life isn't exactly the way we want it and things aren't going the way we want it, we poke our lips out and cross our arms and we don't want anything to do with God or His people. That's the time you need to be closest to Him. And so he was committed to God all the way back in Egypt for the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness. He, he was committed to God even though, listen, he was so frustrated because he and Joshua brought the good report. God was ready to take them on in there to the promised land. And they had to spend 40 years in there because of murmuring and grumbling and complaining people. And yet he still served God with all of his heart. When they got to the Jordan River to finally go over and cross over and the waters miraculously parted there and people were shouting and rejoicing and singing. Oh, he was all up in that too. Because he was serving God. 
wholeheartedly, it says. When they get to Gilgal and they're yet to get over to Jericho, and listen, all of the promised land is occupied by enemies. Do you remember that? I think we forget that part of the story so many times. Oh, they got to, oh, they crossed over Jordan. They got to the promised land. Glory to God. It was all wonderful. No, there was still some conflict ahead. There were some battles to be had. There was some territory to take. But he wholeheartedly followed the Lord. Listen, he was all in regardless of his circumstances. When he was sick, he served God. When he was well, he served God. When he was broke, he served the Lord. When he was prosperous, he served the Lord. When the church was down, he was serving God. When the church was growing, he was serving God. When people liked him, he served God. When people talked about him, and they did, he served God. I'm going to make a bold statement. If your service to God and your worship to God and your giving to God... And the lending of your gifts, talents, and abilities and time to God is contingent upon your circumstances. You've missed the mark. If you and I aren't all in all the time, we aren't all in. Caleb was committed and he said, I wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Verse 9, so that day Moses solemnly promised me the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land that and that of your descendants forever. Notice what Moses said about him 45 years earlier. He said, because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord, my God. Do you see it? Listen, Caleb knew that he wholeheartedly followed God. But let me tell you what else other people will know. It will be evident that you're following God. Verse 10. He says, now as you can see, they're having this conversation. The Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise even while Israel wandered in the wilderness. Notice he said, has kept me alive and well. Those are two separate things. You can be alive and not be very well. Can't you? You can just be hanging on by a thread and still be, quote, alive. He said, but God has kept me alive and kept me well. I think about this story. I think about his age. And I I know how old I am. And I'm getting ready to be another year older, the 22nd of this month. And I thought, good Lord, I'm never going to make it to Caleb's age at the way I'm going. Recently, I had some health issues and still got a little bit of stuff going on with an irregular heartbeat and, and uh, what do they call it? AFib, thank you. You know, I had to go in and get, get, get shocked and put it back in rhythm, and that's worked much better, but it's still, you know, it's missing a beat now and then. And recently, I did a stress test, and I, w- I was around a group of people, and somebody that knew that I'd had the stress test, they said, hey, how'd your stress test go? I said, well, you know, I had it, and I tested positive for stress. <laughs> Very positive, for, which is one of the reasons why I was gone for a week and a half. Try to de-stress some. He said, but the Lord has kept me alive and well, as he promised for the 45 years since Moses made the promise this is a beautiful thing. God would ha- I'm convinced of this. God would have kept Caleb alive and well as long as he needed to to deliver the promise to him. <laughs> I, I, I wish you could get that concept. I said God would have kept him alive and well as long as necessary to get him the promise delivered to him that God made to him 45 years earlier. Because God is not a man that he can lie. He always keeps his promise. And if he's made a promise to you, he will see it through. Notice the next part of that. He said, today, now I don't know if that meant it was his birthday or just that he had already reached this. He said, but today I'm 85 years old. That's quite an accomplishment within itself, isn't it? 
But notice what else he says. I am as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey. What? He's 85. It's been 45 years ago, which means he was 40 years old. He said, I'm as strong and vibrant and as clear thinking right now at 85 as I was when I was 40 years old. Isn't that amazing? Mr. Briley's sitting in the back there in October, right? October coming up, he will be 85 years old, which is remarkable. And every time I see him come in the doors, y'all are an inspiration to me, the commitment to be here to serve the Lord. But I asked him this question. I already knew the answer, but I wanted to ask it to him. I said, Mr. Brown, are you getting ready to be 85? I said, are you as strong and vibrant and clear thinking now as you were when you were 40 years old? He didn't even blink his eyes. He said, no. (laughs) He said, a lot has changed. I understand that. But Caleb declares here, he said, I'm as strong now as when Moses sent me on that journey. Notice he says, and I can still travel. Well, that's a good thing. Because he's had to travel in the wilderness for all those previous years to finally get to the Jordan River to cross over to get into the promised land, right? But he's still got some traveling to do to get to his portion of land. He said, not only am I still strong and vibrant as I was when I was 40, he said, but I can still travel as the Lord leads. And he says, and I can fight as the occasion needs. Can you imagine an 85-year-old man saying, don't, don't get in my face, don't, don't, don't mess with him, I'll take you down. He said, I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. He says, so give me the hill country that the Lord promised to me. Now, he's not being arrogant here. He's not being demanding. He said, listen, we're, we've crossed over now. We're set up here temporarily at Gilgal. He said, I'm ready to receive my inheritance and my portion uh, any time. I'm, I'm ready to go claim that. He said, you will remember that as scouts. You know, remember the 12 that went out and they were to look and get all the information and bring it back. He said, can you remember as scouts, we found the descendants of Anak or the Anakins, which they are called, and by the way, they literally, that word means tall, large. Many translations use the term giants, is what this people group physically were. He says, we found the descendants of Anak, the giants, living there. So they didn't just see the giants, they were living there, and they were in great walled towns. But notice what Joshua said. But if the Lord is with me, he said that then and he's saying it now at 85 years old. He said, if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land. Just as the Lord said. Notice in the promised land, including Caleb's allotment, which is a place called Hebron. We'll talk about in just a moment. That the occupants, the enemies, giants in this case, were still there. Caleb was going to have to go physically to face them, engage them, drive them out in order to possess what God had promised to him. Here's an extremely important point. The promises of God are always true and he'll always see them through. But oftentimes us claiming Hold of what God has promised to us requires effort and intentionality on our part. Let me try to give you an example. Let's say you're struggling with a stronghold or, or bondage or an addiction of some sort. 
you want to get rid of that thing in your life and you've been praying, you, you've got some other people to help you pray and you've been reading the Word of God and, and all of a sudden the, the Holy Spirit quickens a, a scripture or a passage or a chapter to you or a story to you and makes it applicable to you and you see yourself in that gaining the victory over this thing and you've been battling this thing for 15 years and all of a sudden you say, yes, I got a word from God and you get up and walk away and think that that's the end of the story. Oftentimes that's just the beginning of the story. I'm glad I got your attention. I want you to stay with me. This is very important. This is where we often miss, miss it in the church world. We say they got a word from God. They, they saw it in Scripture. They came maybe even to the altar and the God prayed for and it was a glorious time and therefore everything is going to be hung adore. Can I tell you that oftentimes to receive the promise of God, including deliverance, means that we've got to put some work into it. If you've been struggling with that stronghold, that bondage, that addiction for 15 years, you probably are going to need some Christian counseling and or therapy and an accountability group to follow up with on a regular basis. Oh, I lost about half of you right there. You said, I don't believe in that. Oh, my God will just deliver you a super day. Yes, he can. But he often doesn't. He often uses other people to help us on our journey to claim the promises He's given to us. Oh, I, gotta move along. I, I see this from time to time as it relates to marriages. People get in crisis. And listen, you don't get in crisis overnight. Thank you. Some of you are scared to even say amen because you may think the other person... Yeah. You're like... Ooh. You don't get in crisis overnight. Usually when people come talk to me, they're in crisis. And I'm just going to be straight up honest with you. What they want me to do is they want me to pray with them. They want me to share maybe a scriptural principle with them, make a couple recommendations, and let them walk out the door, and they think life's going to go just the way they want it to be a fairy tale. It's never going to happen that way. you got to put the time and the effort and the work in it. Constantly, repeatedly, to grow and develop and to work through those issues so that you experience victory, so that you can have rest in those relationships. Notice he said, when we scouted it out, they were there. I know they're still there, but notice what he said. I will drive them out of the land. He had to get involved and be part of the process. You and I have to be part of our own process sometimes. Remember last week, Timothy has spoke to you about grief, and that's a process. Got a lot of good reports back from what he shared in his personal testimony. He'll be the first one to tell you, you've got to be involved in the process of healing and recovering, whatever it looks like in your life. Verse 13, and we're almost done. So Joshua blessed Caleb and gave Hebron to him as his... Portion. Now, Hebron has its own rich history. It is where David would eventually, or David ruled from for seven years before he took over Jerusalem. It's where a lot of things happened. It's where Abraham received part of the promise of his future. And the list goes on. He says, and he gave Hebron to him as his portion of land. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb. And by the way, Hebron literally means community or alliance or friendship, meaning it's a friendly place to live. It's a place of rest. It's a place of peace. <laughs> I was just thinking, you'd be hard-pressed to find one of those towns in America anymore. But that's literally what the word Hebron means. And notice it says, why did he get it? Because he what? I'm going to wait for you. Because he what? How did he serve the Lord? Wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now notice verse 15. He said previously Hebron had been called Kirath Arba. It had been named after Arba, a great hero of the descendants of Anak, which is one of the giants. But now, listen, it's about to change ownership. It's going to get a new name and a new identity. It's going to have a new future. And look at the last part of that verse. It says, And the land had rest 
from war or conflict or fighting or oppression. Simply put, there are some areas of your life that you are not going to experience rest in until you face the enemy and do some work. Perhaps have some conflict. Deal with the struggle and work through it because victory brings rest. You can have avoidance and never have rest. You can dance around somebody, skirt an issue that you know in your heart needs to be dealt with, and the longer you put it off, the harder it is to deal with. Don't don't you know that to be true? And you'll never have complete rest until you face it. The key points from this message this morning. Remember what the Lord has said about you and me, especially while you're in a place of pain and failure. I can't stress enough how important it is for you to get in the Word of God and get a promise from God for your life. Not long ago, a little issue bubbled up. And I'm just going to tell you the truth. My, my, my emotions and my flesh was like, I'm going to go over here and deal with this. <laughs> Call somebody out. <laughs> give them peace of my mind. My wife said I'd give them so much, I'd wait and have much left. And immediately, immediately, immediately in that moment when my emotions and I was afraid, and and when I'm not afraid, I was afraid, okay, frazzled. I was not experiencing rest in that moment. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit reminded me of a passage of Scripture. and happened to be Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Well, this is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. I took a step back. Took a couple deep breaths. I quoted that verse three or four times. And all of a sudden, rest returned back to my emotions and my spirit. Because that's a promise from God that he spoke to me many, many years ago in a season of my life. I remember on occasion... One of my grown children. (laughs) They're still your children. You know that, don't you? I saw saw something recently. A guy had tweeted. He said, me and my wife decided we don't want to have children. He said, we're going to tell them tonight at dinner. (laughs) One of our grown, grown children, though, we're going through some things and de- just dealing with some stuff. I wanted to get all up in that too. <laughs> Not my place. And the Holy Spirit reminded me that same chapter, Isaiah 54, 13. All of your children shall be taught of the Lord and great shall be the peace of the rest of your children. Hmm. <laughs> I just took a step back again, took a couple of deep breaths and I quoted that verse over and over again. And all of a sudden there bit the frustration, anxiety just left because I remembered some of the promises that God had already made to me if you are still alive and as far as I can tell that's everybody still in here making sure the sleepers are not gone from us but just just resting If you are still alive, remember the promises of God and it's never too late for you to enter your promised land. Somebody needs that right there. You have just walked through a season of pain and loss and suffering and betrayal and hurt. You've had a Kadesh Barnea experience, but God said, just, just remember my promises from the past. You're still alive and well and breathing. I'm going to get you to where I want you to be. Isn't that good news? That God never forgets us or his promises. Your level of commitment. Notice Caleb's was what? It was whole 
wholeheartedly, your level of commitment will determine your opportunity window to receive God's promise. And you say, what in the world did you just say? This is so important. Listen, he was wholeheartedly committed to God. Therefore, God kept him alive and well for 45 more years in order to receive the promise. I'm convinced if he had not been faithful to God or he just served him when it was convenient, I'm convinced he wouldn't have kept him alive and well for 45 years to see the promise. Does that make sense? It matters. I said, it matters your level of commitment to serving God. It helps determine the window of opportunity for you to receive the promises of God. He was wholeheartedly committed. Periods of rest come only after you have dealt with a problem. I want to read you a, a passage real quick out, out of Numbers 13, and then we're, we're going to pray. Numbers 13, 23, it says, They came to the valley, and this is when they were scouting the land 45 years earlier. When they came to the valley of Eshcol, they cut down a branch with a single cluster of grapes. One cluster, okay? Cut it off the vine. One cluster of grapes so large that it took two of them, two of the men, to carry it on a pole between them. They also brought back samples of pomegranates and figs. And when you jump down to verse 28 and and verses after that, it says people living there were powerful and their towns were large. And there were giants there, the descendants of Anak that we've already talked about. And here's here's the last point I want to make. Your potential fruit or harvest for your future is directly proportional to to the size of the problem you're facing right now. For somebody, you ought to get real excited because you're like, I'm in a great big dilemma and a big old problem that seems insurmountable. And what I'm telling you, the potential harvest for you, if you're facing a giant right now, the harvest for your future looks giant. The grapes were giant proportions. Facing pint-sized problems. You still want victory through that. I understand that. So do I. But the rewards, the harvest potential is pint size. So what I'm telling you today is all of us ought to commit ourselves to wholeheartedly following God. Remembering His promises to us. Knowing that He is faithful to deliver And that the bigger our problem that we're facing, trying to get victory over right now, means there's an absolute great big harvest over here waiting on us. Isn't that good to know? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you for the beautiful time of worship through song and music. We thank you that you've chosen to speak such a simple yet powerful message to us about living victoriously so that we can have rest. Lord, there's so many things that you've shown us in this word today. And I think that perhaps the most important that we need to be reminded of as Caleb that we need to be committed wholeheartedly that we are all in when things are ugly and they're difficult and they're challenging when we're broke, when we're sick when our families are torn apart that we are going to wholeheartedly serve you and follow you and when things are going good we're going to wholeheartedly follow you we are going to worship you and to seek after you and in doing so you help us to remember the promises that you've made to us that we can hold on to those. Lord, for the individuals in this place that have had a promise from your word, it may have been a year, a month, may have been 10 years ago, and they're struggling right now. May they remember the promise that you've made to them through your word. May they realize the fact that they are here today listening to this message, that they are alive and able to be here, that you are letting them know that it's never too late for them to receive what you have promised to them. 
Thank you for reminding us, Lord, when we go through the difficult seasons and challenges of life, that you are there with us and for us. That victory brings rest. Lord, there are people in here that need victory. Some of them in their physical bodies, they need a healing. Some of them need healing in their marriage relationships or in their families or in their extended relationships. Some of them need financial healing. Some of them need mental and emotional healing and strength and comfort to find rest. And I pray that that would be the case today before they leave this place. In Jesus' name we pray and ask it. just a moment the team is going to sing again I, I love that song this morning my God is faithful his promises are true he's bigger better stronger and greater than anyone or anything else including your struggle today as they prepare to sing I want you to worship but if you want myself and some of our leaders and anybody that wants to come forward to pray over you you may be in a particular area in your life where you need and want victory today because you desperately need to find rest for your soul whatever that looks like I want to invite you to these altars and we're going to spend some time in prayer with you believing that God's going to do a miraculous thing for you so as they sing, these altars are open.